both those that are present here and those on live stream. We're grateful that you're here with us. Amen. This is a fellowship, you know. Amen. We're in the book of Amos. This will be our 17th installment. I've entitled this The Revealing God. Now, when the Lord uh, confers special privileges upon people, they've got to respond appropriately, Amen. even extraordinarily. It is true, as the Lord Jesus himself said, unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Even, even men do this. Now let's take, for example, the church after the first century that takes us in. Think of the advantages that the church after the first century had. They had extensive exposition through the apostles and through prophets and teachers of the coming of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the exaltation of Jesus, the present ministry of Jesus, the enthronement of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. There are a lot of churches in the first part the book of Acts didn't have. Now, if what Jesus said is true, and it emphatically is, the church of our day should be producing more fruit than the church of the first century. I mean, I don't know how you'd, uh, how you'd disprove this. But this is not even the mindset of what professes to be the church. Almost to a person, those who are preachers and teachers consider the church in the book of Acts to be the premier church, the church at its most pristine, pure state. And they're trying to restore that one. This is flawed thinking. And the movement that birthed it is a flawed movement. God's kingdom is like a stone that started out little and it never did go back to little. Amen. It kept advancing and advancing until it became a mountain that filled the whole earth. So this fact that more is re required of those that have received more, this, this is not being stated in our day. Not to any, not to any measurable extent. But it is true, God's going to judge this generation as a generation that had access to an abundance of truth. He will not excuse the type of things that we're seeing take place in the name of Christ today. The prophecy of Amos is opening up this very truth that I just talked about. God announced judgments against some heathen nations. Now he's talking to Israel. And he's going to be expect more out of Israel than he got out of the heathen nations. He's going to class Israel, their conduct, along with the Philistines, Tyre, Sidon, Edom, Ammonites, and Moabites who received nothing from God, not so much as a syllable. No law, no promises, no prophet, no savior, no deliverance. But Israel is now classed along with them. 
I mean, you, who doesn't see the parallel? Israel yielded a miserable harvest to God, likened to wild grapes and sour grapes. He didn't eat them either. He didn't receive what Israel offered up to him. That's what he's going to say in Amos. Get it out of my sight. Stop coming together in my name. Stop it. Shut your music down. He's going to tell him that. The noise of your vials. Get it out of my sight. It's a, an interesting thing to consider that God probably doesn't receive most of the religion offered up to him on Lord's Day in Joplin, Missouri. It's probably rejected and hits the brass heavens. I think it's time someone started saying this because things are going from bad to worse. So now God's going to reason with us here tonight about these things. We're going to be looking at verses 7, 8, and 9 of the third chapter of Amos. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. The lion hath roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Publish in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces of the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof. Now that's our... Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, this is a potent text. I don't mind telling you. But I like potency Amen. because it jars you out of complacency. I'm tired of pussyfoot Indian rubber theology. I'm tired of it. Don't want to hear it anymore. I'm for getting the babies out of the pulpits and getting the infant jargon out of the, out of the speaking. I'm getting rid of them. I'm talking about just get them out. They've done too much damage. Let's hear what the Lord has to say. Now, first of all, in this text, we're exposed to a working God. All right, that's kind of a different concept <laughs> than people know today. <clears throat> a God who's always doing something. Okay? Surely the Lord will do nothing except he's, he's a God that does something. Jesus said, my father worked hitherto or before this, and I'm working. So that's, that's, that's the nature of deity. He also said of his own works, My father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. See, God's a worker. He's a doer. <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost, the subject that Paul Peter delineated was the wonderful works of God. See, the world, what is the world? It's a, an arena in which God is working. That's what it is. It's an arena in which God is working. There are people that draw our attention to what's going on in the world, see, but they don't make any mention of God. They're not qualified to speak. Amen. The scripture tells God is out working out, working all, working all things together for the good of them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. He's working. See, he's working. In the matter of spiritual gifts, it is written, it is the same God that worketh. It's a worker, see, all in all. When you were baptized, God worked. Amen. Amen. What he did is called the operation of God. It's that something God did. It's a work. God's a worker, a doer. Believers are told, it is God that worketh in you, both the will and do of his own good pleasure, see. Paul spoke of the effectual working of his power. See, God's a worker and he's a doer. The gospel is a declaration of what the Lord has done or worked. 
That's what it is. The gospel is not a declaration of what you ought to do. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that's right. Although there's some you ought to do, but that's not the gospel. Yeah. That's why the gospel is referred to as the gospel of God. Mm-hmm. Not it's ever called the gospel of you or the gospel of the church. Like Israel, and this is tragic, but like Israel, the church has not made enough of what the Lord has done. See, it's hard to exploit what the Lord has done. You can't make a name for yourself declaring what the Lord has done. This won't get you an increase in wages, telling what the Lord has done. This won't make a place for you in the world, telling what the Lord has done. But that's what's got to be told, what the Lord has done. The psalmist used these words, work, a do and work. They're not synonymous. Doing and work are not synonymous words. I want to distinguish between them now. The psalmist used both words in this way. And all men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. Psalm 64, 9. Other versions say they'll consider what he has done. That is, the work of God resulted in something being accomplished. What he worked was he parted the Red Sea. That was the work. What was done, he delivered Israel through the sea. That's what was done. You have to distinguish between the work of God and what's done. See, the work of God is sending Jesus, so forth, but it's what was done by that work. That is the point of proclamation. When the prophet says, the Lord will do nothing, he is saying the Lord will not set out to accomplish something without first announcing it. Now, this is a divine trait now. God works by objective. He always does things for a reason. Amen. And he has an intended, something that is intended to be accomplished. And when he, he doesn't set out to do something without telling his prophets what he's going to do. He announces his objectives. Never sets out to do something without announcing them. If he determines to bruise the serpent's head, he announces it. If he determines to give the land of Canaan to Abraham and his seed, he announces it, reveals it. If he's going to give a son to a couple that are totally incapable of having a son, he announces it. He announces it ahead of time. If he determines to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he announces it. If he's determined to give Israel a son and then lay the government upon his shoulder, he announces it. This is God's manner, see, it's God's manner. If he's determined to send Israel into captivity because of their sin, he announces it. Sends his prophets to tell them. God doesn't work unannounced. This is not his manner. Why? Why is it his matter? Because he's working for his glory. Yeah. And he gets the glory by you knowing what he's doing. Yeah. Amen. That's what gives him glory. Necessary not to spurn the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. That's right. Saying that that's the place where these prophets were giving these announcements of what God is doing. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. What God determines to do by its very nature is a secret. Nobody can figure out what God's going to do. If God doesn't reveal it, it just remains in oblivion. What God determines can't be figured out or calculated. It has to be revealed. And God's nature is to reveal it. That's his manner. He's graciously made his intentions known so sensitive souls can prepare. Amen. And get glory to it. So that people can assess it and say that's what he said he'd do. 
See, at some point, now this is very unusual for a Christian to reason this way. This is very unusual, I'm going to tell you. But a Christian should say, look what's happened to me. Yeah. This is what God said he'd do. Yeah. But you would be hard-pressed to find a person who thinks this way. If it is, they're unusual. They're unusual. It's not how they, see, the modern, what's being preached doesn't lead people to think it does, after all said and done, what's being preached as the, the, the norm I'm talking about doesn't lead people to think this way. Yeah. They think, have I done everything I should? That's how they think. When they should think, has God done what he said he would do? Yeah. They should think, am I a new creature? Mm -hmm. Go to work on it and try and figure it out. I don't think it's possible to be a new creature and to lack any evidence thereof. Yeah, amen. Right. <laughs> amen. Heavenly given, and give great glory to God when you make these, these, these yeah. you can see these traits in That's you right. that you know they weren't there before. It is the and Lord. you yeah. can see it, and then you can glorify God. Yeah. This is right. why God, see, does, doesn't do anything except he tells his amen. servants the prophets. Now, the divine manner of announce what he's going to do has reached his crescendo in the day of salvation. He's done more, so he's announced. He's announced more. He's revealed. So it's unquestionable what he means, that the world's going to be destroyed, the heavens and the earth by fire. He's made that known. This is what I'm going to do. People are living just like God didn't say that. People are living just like God didn't even say that. But he did. He did say it. Because he won't do it unless he makes it known. He's revealed as a day of judgment. Everybody's going to stand before me and give an account down into every idle word. It's going, but he's living just like that isn't true. I, I hope no one like that is here. But if you are, you've got to stop doing it now, right now. You've got to stop living like God didn't say this. Because he made it known so God's people would people get ready for it. God just told you, I'm going to unveil Jesus. People speculating about Jesus. They, even the artists, they have their concepts about Jesus. And, and the various gospels have their ideas about Jesus. But I'm going to unveil him. I'm going to unveil what he really is. Amen. So you, be, you better be knowing that ahead of time. Amen. I'm going to unveil him. He's the only potentate. He's... Not a potentate. He is the only potentate. Amen. And you talk about kings. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's what he is. Not what he shall be. It's what he is. Yeah. So God has told us ahead of time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that. He's even announced the destiny of certain people. Take, for instance, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. They're going to go to hell. Amen. Right. Revelation 21. Right. They'll have their part. Yeah. And like, he told ahead of time where they're going. Uh -huh. So someone say, well, I feel so sorry for them. You feel sorry for them? You feel sorry for them? You should feel zealous to tell them where they're going and what provision God made not to go there. Don't be about feeling sorry for sinners. God didn't send us to feel sorry for sinners. You'd be polite and I understand about being merciful and this sort of thing, but I'm talking about they got to be told what's going to happen. They got to be told. God's servants, the prophets, now they're the custodians of the revelation. They've been chosen and empowered to announce what God's going to do. Because God wants people to know what he's going to do. He did it in pre preparation for coming to Christ. He announced what he's going to do. The prophets preached what they're going to do. And when Jesus came, the insightful people said, this is the one they said. Yeah, amen. I'm going to tell you that the, the average American doesn't have the faintest idea how to identify Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Not even the faintest idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the early people, they did. Oh, this is he of whom Moses and their prophets 
This is him. He the prophet of faith will announce it. So that what has happened is Satan has fabricated a special Jesus that's a really nice guy. Be your pal. You don't tell him, okay, he expects you when you say, come walking on the water, he expects you to get out of the boat and start walking. Amen. This is the Jesus we're talking about here. Amen. If he tells the disciples, give them something to eat. Talking about a multitude of 5,000 men beside women and children. He means that. Yeah. For the days over, they will do it. Amen. So the things God has said he had, would do has, uh, has been announced by the prophets. And these are the things that would be the focus of our attention. Yeah. Yeah. Your theology, whatever it is, this has got to be the meat and core of it yeah. right here. What God has said he's going to do. That's got to be the thing that you settle down in right there. And other things are on the side. They're not, they're, they're a side dish. They're not the main dish. So these people have a ministry. They call it a ministry. Their ministry is to help fussing married people get together and be happy. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Well, it's not nice. How can people that are reconciled to God, you got two people, both of them are really reconciled to God, how can they not be reconciled to one another? Like, how is this possible? But people think as though that was possible. We're both Christians, we love the Lord with all of our heart, but we just can't get along anymore. Liar, liar, pants on fire. As you see. Nose as long as a telephone wire. See that little rhyme people used to say because people talk like this. They don't. They don't realize what they're saying is not true. But all human frailties and tendencies are addressed in salvation. They're all addressed in salvation. God told the people He's going to be a branch of righteousness. His name will be called a branch of righteousness. He'll save his people from their sins. He'll give them one speech. He'll bring give them one heart. He'll be that they'll have a high regard for one. He's told them what he's going to do. That's God's main, that's God's nature. So God will surely, surely, God will do nothing except he reveals his secret unto his servants. Listen, he doesn't reveal it to, the, to a local seminary or college and they reveal it. He reveals it to his, ser to his servants of prophets. Now, I admit some of the prophets may be in one of those institutions, but it's probably not likely. He continues. <coughs> yes. Before you move on from that, I was considering that when men make a determination, sometimes they don't tell their intentions. That's right. Fear that frustrated yes, right. they wouldn't be able to bring it to pass or the enemy might yeah. stop them from, yeah. from accomplishing yes, right. those things but you see the sovereignty of God that he tells what he's going to do Amen. Yeah. because there is no one that's going to stop announces it him. to his enemy Amen. tells him what he's going to do right, right, the, right before the race gets off to a start he tells it, Satan what he's going to do <laughs> challenges him and they have the ability to be able to knock the dust off these things and reveal them to yeah, the yeah. to the body of Christ. They're they're doing you a great favor. Oh yeah. See, once you see it, yeah. it's like why didn't I see it yeah. before? I mean, that's it's, that's how plain it is. But it isn't that it wasn't plain. It's that we had blinders on, yes, amen. and they were religious blinders, yes. which is the worst of all blinders. Yes, I remember. Uh, Sometime back, before I had my cataracts removed, I was always on Sister June about the lighting in this room here. I said, there's not enough light in here. You can hardly see anything. We've got to get more watts. She said, well, they're pretty high, so we've got to get some higher watts and get some light in here. And I had these cataracts removed, and I almost blinded me when I come in here. It was me. It wasn't the light. It was me. Yeah. I didn't know it, see, because yeah. I'd learned to, I'd grown accustomed mm -hmm. to not seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine how that blind man, the most blind man Jesus healed, how it felt, that burst, first burst of light. Yeah. See, it took grace to take a lot of light. Yeah. 
That could have blinded them again if they, if they didn't have a lot of grace. The lion hath roared. <laughs> now I was going to address how logical it is. It's really logical to pay attention when God speaks. I mean, <laughs> you shouldn't have to like go into a lengthy discourse to prove you should listen if God speaks. I mean, man can't be indifferent to the revelations of God. See, God makes it known. He's told us that God he doesn't do anything. See, he makes it known. Now he's going to say, now when he does, you better be listening. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? <clears throat> Other versions read, a lion has roared, who will not fear? I like this one. The, the cry of the lion is sounding, who will not have fear? Listen, listen, listen. Hear that swirling wind? Well, if they heard it, they did. They moved into action. Yes, Am I not right? Yes, but when the Lord speaks, see, the only people that don't do something are the people that didn't hear. That's right. Who will not fear? The sense of the text is the lion's, lion's presently roaring. Mm -hmm. God has already defined that he's roaring in the sense he's announcing and judgment that's imminent. It's about to happen. So he's he's roaring like a lion ready to pounce on the prey. Now who is it that's not going to listen? Those that listen, they'll find out we're trapped. No way out of this. Psalm, Psalm 107, 27 said they were at their wits end. They run out of intelligence and run out of wit and run out of... They just... <laughs> See, some people can work themselves out of just about any circumstance, except, except when God's working. He has no wiggle room at all. So the sense of the text is that the lion presently war, roaring, war, roaring, and it, it doesn't make sense to be casual. Amen. The point is, God has roared against Israel. He's announced the judgments on the around the corner, and it ought to have produced fear among those who heard. Amen. All right, now we should say a word about being dull of hearing. Jesus said there were some conditions that accompanied this dull of hearing phenomenon. It's a, pheno it's a spiritual phenomenon. Dull of hearing. Most of you have seen a lot of this. So I'm going to try and define it a little bit more so you'll recognize it. Here's some things that accompany being dull of hearing. This is found in Matthew 13, 15. This people's heart is waxed to gross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That means yuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. I, God says, I won't let them hear it. Because yeah. right. yeah. then they'll call out and I'll save them. Yeah. I'm not going to save these people. Uh -huh. Yo, it sounds kind of scary. It's intended to sound scary. Amen. Now Paul quoted these words, these very that very those very words, which quoted from Isaiah, he quoted them to some Jews, casual Jews in Rome. When he arrived at Rome, you remember, and he called for the Jews to come? He explained to them he wasn't going to prison because he's a malefactor of some kind. He, had, he gave his testimony, and he quotes this text to those Jews. He says, don't, don't you be this kind of people. Paul wrote to the Hebrews that I had a lot about Melchizedek. I had a lot of things to say about Melchizedek, but I couldn't say them to you because you were dull of hearing. Your ears were dull of hearing. What, what's that mean, dull of hearing? Other versions read, slow to learn. You know anybody like that? I know some people like this. I'm not, I won't name them, don't worry. But I know some people, they, they learn slow. Takes a long time for something to seep in. 
That's dull of hearing. That's what that is. Slow to hear. Slow to learn. Dull in understanding. Hard of hearing. You know, yeah, I have hard of hearing. You know, when all of you speak up, you got to remember Brother Tony and Brother Given. We miss about like three quarters of what's said. Well, we're, we're, we're dull of hearing and hard of hearing. That's what he, that's what he means, hard of hearing. Scarcely can hear, one version says. There are people who can barely hear what God's saying. It's like a kind of a faint whisper. They can't quite make it out. Dull of hearing. You know people like this? Maybe you've preached or you've taught people like this. They just couldn't get it. Well, it's a serious condition. One time, a group of people in this category, God spoke. Jesus prayed publicly. He said, glorify thy name. And God spoke publicly. He said, I have both glorified it, but glorify it again. There were some people that were dull of hearing. Yeah. And he said, it thundered. Oh, whoo, why'd you hear that clap of thunder? Yeah. What was it? it dull. Yeah. Their hearing was bad. Uh -huh. Didn't have good hearing. Other people had a little better hearing. They were, they were dull of hearing, too, but it was a little better. They said, it was an angel. See, they got little... And Jesus, he had a good hearing. He said, this voice was spoken for me. Over time, some people have experienced a loss of spiritual hearing. There was a time when they could pick up on the things of God pretty quick. Soon as someone, they could just understand it, they could hear it, they could respond to it. But over a period of time, the guy got dull of hearing. They couldn't hear it at all. And there's some people that can't, they just can't hear at all. Jesus said to a group of people listening to him, he said, why do you not understand my speech? Yeah. You know, they say, well, we don't understand it because it's too deep. It's too deep. No, I said, that's not it at all. I'm going to tell you why you can't understand my speech. Just translate, why don't you understand the Bible? Well, we'll just yeah. use it that way. Yeah. Think of it this way. He said, I'll tell you why. Because you can't hear my word. Yeah. You don't understand because the thing's not getting through to you. Yeah. That's what he told the people. That's what he told them. Yeah, so that means that some people, when it says crucify the flesh, they just can't make the connection right. that they shouldn't do things that are wrong. Yeah, they can't, they, yeah. They can't even hear this word. Yeah. It's just like... It's just like somebody whispered something or a garbled speech and they, just, they can't pick it up on it. Right. It's like they spoke in tongues. Mm -hmm. They yeah. just don't know, what it, they don't know what was said. Yeah. Why don't they know what's said? Remember back when Jesus described? It's because their hearts hard, their yeah. eyes had closed. Yeah. It's, just, <laughs> yeah. it's not an innocent situation. Amen. People that can't hear have had heart problem and vision problem for some time. Says, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand yeah, not. Right. See ye indeed, mm. but perceive not. Yeah. Gives you that picture that the more the prophet prophesies, the more the people harden their hearts. That's right. Amen. See, a person, any person who is a real servant of God wants the people to understand. Yeah. I mean, that, but when you've got hard heads... That, that desire leaves. Yes, amen. Yes. In another place that's written, the entrance of thy yeah, Lord amen. giveth light. Uh -huh. Amen. There are people who don't give entrance. That's right. They they resist the Holy Spirit. That's right. Mm -hmm. And they, you can't, you can't receive what God has to say unless you're willing to be conformed by what amen. he says. Amen. Amen. So that's the essence of a hard heart in resisting the word of God is refusing to allow its work. Amen. And to, uh, to, to actually cleave to the enmity. Yes. See, when God speaks, those who hear, see, a prophet, who's not going to prophesy? Yeah. If God gave a message, 
What am I going to go ask the people if they want to hear it? Is this what you're going to do? Because I hope you don't mind if I say this. Just shout it from the housetops. What you've got from God, it doesn't make any difference whether people want to hear it or not because God's revealed what he's going to do. So you announce it. Who can but prophesy? The NIV reads, the sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? <laughs> Who's going to contend with God and not say what he said? Do you think God speaks just to hear himself speak? He speaks so it will be told. The Almighty has spoken. Who can keep from prophesying? God's word Bible says. The net Bible says the sovereign Lord has spoken. Who can refuse to prophesy? This is God that said this. Yeah. All right, now some scholars enter. Yeah, but we're not sure if the text has been altered or not. This is their contribution. This is their contribution to the church. They have made people doubt that the word of God is true. Amen. That's their ministry, Amen. which means they're from the devil. Amen. Amen. Who can but prophesy? Now this is, an, uh, this is observation, who can but prophesy? That's the response of a t person with a tender heart, a tender spirit. When God has spoken, then we're, we're, there's not going to be a t person of tender heart that's going to refuse to pass it on. To be like Jeremiah, he said, <laughs> Thy word is in mine heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing. I could not stay or I couldn't hold it in. I just <laughs> I had to say it. People didn't want to hear it, so he did say, I'm not going to say okay, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. You don't want to hear it, I'm not going to say it. See, God wouldn't let him rest. Prophet's going to prophesy. Finally, said, "Boy, I want to say I can't going to get any relief till I declare this." So it may not have brought relief to the people, but it brought relief to the prophet. Yes. Eli taught Samuel that very same principle when he said, uh, what, "What the Lord has told you, tell me every single thing. Don't hide one thing." That's but right. If you do, then may that be upon you. That's right. Amen. To yes. no longer speak in the name of Jesus. <laughs> That's right. And they said, you, you judge whether it's right uh -huh. in the sight of God to listen to you more than God. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it's, a good, it's a really wise response. Isn't it? I had the occasion to actually use this. I was a young man, you know, young naive man. And I was told, shut up, for all practical purposes, by the school, stop. I said, now, I used those words. I said, now, you, you, you tell me, should I listen to you rather than God? You, you tell me. And understand that I'm not going to listen to you when you say it. Because I already know the answer. But it, it wasn't received, but that's beside the point. Now, here's what God said to a prophet. He said this to a prophet. He said, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And thou givest him not warning. Nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. He said, well, I'm dealing with a drunk. Dope head, an adulterer. You can say, you're going to die. You're not going to get by with this. You're going to die. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you'll probably go to hell. Mm -hmm. See, God God warns people like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why aren't they being warned? Why are yeah. workshops set up for them instead of warnings? Mm -hmm. A lot of people probably would have repented long ago yeah. if they were warned. Amen. Yeah. That's right. The lion's roaring. Uh -huh. yeah. Who's going to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say what he said? In our day, the lion has roared. Warn them that are unruly. Well, who, who's going to say I'm not going to do that? Well, there are people that do. God has warned. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief 
in departing from the living God. Well, we don't believe that here. We believe that once you're in, you're always in. See? That's a roar. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Here's another one. Feed the flock of God. Well, who's going to ignore that? He's been ignored. Yeah. Jesus has roared. He said, uh, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So he tells you right up front, see, this is what God has willed. This is what God has determined. So he announces it. Nobody's getting in that doesn't do what I tell them to do. Amen. We all make mistakes. No one is going to get in that doesn't do what God tells them to do. No compromise. So well, nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to get in that doesn't do what God tells them to do. You can say, what if nobody's going to get in? That's what he said. I mean, how, about, how, much, how much more plain can it be? Yeah. That's a roar. Amen. That's right. And I can tell you that if you take it seriously, you'll get the wherewithal to do what you yeah. should do. Amen. That's the point. At the, yeah. your, when your heart uh -huh. is inclined to do the word at that point, then you'll be able to take up your bed and walk, yeah. so to speak. Amen. Yes. That a warning needs to be fitly spoken, mm -hmm. but we live in a time where Satan has crafted the lie that a warning will turn someone away from saving grace uh -huh. rather than towards yes. it. Yes, that's right, that's mm -hmm. good. Amen. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, some, some can't hear the Lord has roared, but some haven't heard it. Some have heard it, but they don't know what's said. They're like a, a hemias, you remember? King said, "What what what happened? Uh, heaven is was a postman. He ran, delivered a message. He got to David. And David said, well, what, what's what's happening?' He says, "Well, I saw a tumult, but I don't know what it was." Uh, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> That's what he said. David said, "Well, stand over here till the next messenger comes up." Uh, who shy? He had he had something to say. So I, I think there's a lot of people that really they don't know what to say. Yeah. Say, "Well, you yeah, just ought to try harder." Yes. Speaking about this, this matter of uh, the Word of God coming to people and whether or not they can receive it, mm -hmm. uh, people seem to think of this as a matter of uh, an exertion of the will of man. Or they, they call it the choice. And that men are judged by what choice they make. But it seems that at a deeper level, the judgment is whether or not they can receive it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it may look like men have chosen, but it's it's like whenever the word of God comes, the the level at which it judges, if it if it comes to an honest and a good heart, it's received. Mm -hmm. And if the heart is evil and unbelieving. It can't be received. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the things that people do, it looks like they're choosing, but really, it's their initial response Amen. to the word of God. The word of God, just the res just the availability mm -hmm. and the coming of the word of God judges a person. Amen. Mm -hmm. Here's a man now. He's been coming to the pool of Bethesda for a long time. Thirty-eight years, he hasn't walked. For 38 years, he's been impotent. His legs must have shriveled up, you know. Mm -hmm. He hadn't walked for 38 years. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be made whole? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want this? Yeah. Or do you prefer to beg? Mm -hmm. Well, some people really do prefer to beg. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. He said, I give you a job. No, no, I'd rather stand out here and hold this sign up, work for food. Yeah. Uh -huh. The man said, I got this trouble. It, with, an angel comes on and troubles the waters, and when he does, the first one in gets healed. And us sick folk, we're really polite. People, folk with infirmities are really polite. Says they crawl right over me and they get in before me. See, <laughs> people, 
people have the infirmity of sin. They aren't, they're not polite. Yeah, right. They're yeah. thinking of themselves. So Jesus said to him, he says, well, just pick up your bed and walk. All right, what does it take for a man like that? What does it take for a man like that to pick up his bed and walk? All he can really do is want to, That's right. if you get right down to it. But that's what God was looking for. Amen. See, that, that's what he was looking for. Amen. At the point he desired it, then the power of God met him, and he stood up and walked. See, the trouble with people today is they don't want yeah. to quit sinning. Amen. At the moment they do, yeah. they'll get their heart's desire. Amen. Yeah, great kingdom secret. Amen. All right, now the, the ninth verse Publish in the palaces of Ashdod and the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, Assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumults in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof. Now, Samaria was the capital of Israel. Remember, there's a judgment against Israel. It's the capital of Israel and the area of Samaria was the physical geography where it was located. Now the Lord commands that what he said be published. Publish, remember? You have roared, publish. But notice who he says to publish it to. Ah, the palaces of Ashdod and the palaces of the land of Egypt. These are heathen people. Gentile people. Publish it. Proclaim it. Give out the news. Announce it. Call people together. Make it heard. The Lord reveals something. He intends for it to be heard. Now he's going to pick out. I want these heathen to hear this. This is at the point Sister Ada brought up where Peter said, whether it be right in the sight of God, right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you, you, you judge it. You tell me. Well, that would be a hard thing to answer, wouldn't it? Yeah. Tell it to Ashdod and Egypt. I'm going to accentuate the wickedness that is engulfed Israel. He's going to call for the heathen to come down into the territory of his people. Get up there on the mountains where you can see really plain. I want you to look at my people and you'll see why I'm judging them the way I am. Even you'll be able to see it. Even you'll be able to see it. Behold the tumults. That's in Samaria. That's in God. the capital of Israel. This is the chief city. Behold the tumults. Some verses read the great unrest, the great outcries. There are turmoil, great uproar, follies, great confusions. Great disorders, acts of violence, chaos, great outrages, many troubles, scandalous spectacles, confusion, disorder. Look at it. This is among my people. Come on, Ashdod and Egypt. Look at this. This is the same kind of stuff that's in the world. It's a heathen world, except it's even worse here. I want you to see what's happened to my people. Social unrest and confusion, hostility, astounding displays of wickedness. Let those who dwell in the palaces of Ashdod and Egypt evaluate this. You just now evaluate. Is this right? Is what this people are doing? Is it right? Those in the palaces of Ashdod would unanimously say no. This is not right. People down in Egypt, they'd see the injustice of it all and say it's not right. <laughs> Behold the oppression. Look at the oppression. Injustice, tyranny, cruel acts, injustice. The message Bible says it is a snake pit of brutality and terror. Look at the thoughtless things that are going on down there. Israel was oppressing its own people. They sold them, neglected them, treated them like social refuse. Isaiah said nobody among them was calling for justice or pled for the truth. Isaiah 59.4, it was so bad the Lord said judgment is turned away backward. 
Justice standeth afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. Equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and there is no judgment. It's Isaiah 59, 15. See, God wanted the heathen to witness to the depravity of these people, to observe when God judged them it was because of their condition. That's why. Many of these very nations had already witnessed God's disfavor. They, when the Israelites were in their favor, they conquered some of these, yeah. some of these nations. All right, now let's, let's personalize this. How about the condition of the church? There's a parallel to be seen here that involves the church of our time. It is a living contradiction to God's salvation. Amen. Amen. And that goes for just about any church. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you find one is not this way, and there are some, mm -hmm. they are the exception. Yes. It's very unusual. Mm -hmm. Very unusual to find a church that's not bathed in mediocrity. Mm -hmm. Spiritual mediocrity. Yeah. You may be doing a lot of things. But all the sins that are described in the church, or they're in the world, are now in the fallen church. Mm -hmm. The door swung open, and all of the sins that are in the world have flooded now into the church. Yeah. Now, Paul prophesied that this would happen. It's in 2 Timothy 3, 5. This is the falling away he's talking about. Yeah. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. These are professing Christian people he's talking about. Men should be lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent or uncontrollable, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. It's, these are church people. Yeah. Having a form of godliness, but denying or rejecting the power thereof. What should we do, Paul? Turn away. Now, God has called the world to examine the church, and they're doing it. In the past few years, they've been doing it. They've been hauling out these evangelists that make over a million dollars a year. They've been shining the spotlight on bogus miracles, $30,000 a night motel bills, hotel bills. They've been, throw, they've been dragging, dragging all this out. What is this? God's called these heathen up to the mountaintops. Look what's happening there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm about to break this thing up. Mm -hmm. And even the world's going to be able to see they had it coming. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. That's what God's doing in our day. This is, this is actually beginning to happen. Yeah. He's going to call inferior judges, and inferior judges will be able to spot the trouble before the preachers and teachers have spotted it. Yeah. Amen. That's a sad state of affairs, brethren. Yeah. A sad state of affairs. Now, I understand that people don't want us to talk this way. They'd rather be polite. You know, well, hell's not worth it. Amen. Being an unfaithful servant is not worth the accolades of the professed church. Yeah, right. It's not worth it. Now, if you see it, quite frequently, this will be on the news media. Quite frequently, they'll be have some expose. Of someone that has a thriving ministry and they are living in a lap of luxury and sometimes they've been immoral. There have been several cases of immorality, the worst kind of immorality. That's his, he has, God has assembled the spectators from the world to see what's so glaringly obvious. This isn't secret sin. See, the, the modern church isn't guilty of sin that's hidden under the table. It's sticking right out in front of your face. That's why he's called, just like he did Israel. You can think what an Israelite, to have to have somebody from Ashdod in Egypt evaluate you. I mean, that's, a, that's getting pretty bad. But that's how bad Israel got. And so uh, God tells Amos, look, I can't find very many people in the, among the priesthood. So you go down there to the palaces of Ashdod and palaces of Egypt, and I gotta have some witnesses. Amen. 
I'm not going to do something unless I make it known. And so I'm going to let these people make it. They're going to play a role in making this known. See, this condition is crying out for divine judgment. So when you see it, it'll, if you've got it ten right, it'll sadden you. Make no mistake about it. You'll shed some tears over the existence of the thing. We can't be indifferent to it. But this will confirm to you, God's not going to let this keep going. And I'm going to disassociate myself from that. Whatever summons God's judgment, you got to disconnect from it. Amen. That's right. At some point, uh -huh. it's got to happen. Now you do, you have to see it. I understand that. I think I close there, but that is uh, it's such an interesting text. I want to do a little more thinking about it. It's to think that God would call on Ashdod and Egypt. Get up there in the mountains and look. Look right now what's going on down there. Yeah. Same stuff that's going on in heathen. It's going on there. <laughs> same, yeah. same thing. And everybody knows this, see? This doesn't take anybody by surprise. Yeah. Most Christians know this. But see, they've been taught a gospel that it's all right. God understands. Yeah. Yeah. But right. no, it's not all right, and God doesn't understand. God's revealing himself in this text. This is a revelation of God Almighty. Why was he so intolerant with Israel? Because he had given them more. Amen. That's why he had given them more. It was not right for them to yield a crop of sour grapes to, the, to God Almighty. And it's not right that God should be offered up a bunch of workshops and recovery programs. This is not right. Amen. And the blowhards can say it is. They're just wrong. Yeah. It, I think it's time to butt heads with some of these people. Uh -huh. yeah. They're wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not right mm -hmm. for this to occur in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is how he treats it now. Mm -hmm. He treats it. This, is, this was in my Jezebel. You was teaching in one of my churches. And my church lets you do it. And so I'm serving notice now. The hammer's coming down on you and whoever's with you. I'm going to kill them with death. Now we, we know this condition's been going on for a while. But now it seems to me that we're, we're about to have them cast into bed. <laughs> it's going to happen, so... Learn from this uh, book of Hosea. Do it. You, you can't do it just by being angry. Uh -huh. You learn from it. This, this is a commentary on the subtlety of Satan. This tells you how subtle he is. He can even deceive church members that have been washed and justified and sanctified. That's how subtle he is. He'll sing a religious tune, play a religious flute, lead him right into the lake of fire. Yeah. Yeah. All right, any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Yes. Um, when you said that there are people who can barely hear what the Lord is saying, it's going to get worse and worse, and someday they'll just become deaf and not hear the Lord at all. That's right. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, amen. Yes, Brother Jason. There's a if you pay if you pay attention to what's going on in our culture, a lot of what you've been saying there at the end of the lesson there is, is being confirmed. Yeah. Um, our our culture is is pointing out the the hypocrisy That's right. of the uh, of the organized church. Yeah. And all of the numbers are saying that Americans are leaving the organized yeah, church. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that pagan people always draw the right conclusions, mm -hmm. because a lot, a lot of pagan people don't. Mm -hmm. uh, they often reject 
they, they, they do what we call throw out the baby with the yeah. bath water, which is obviously a mistake. However, many, many pagan people do make the right observations about what's going on in the organized church. And it's, it's interesting sometimes to read what they say. Yes, it is. Um, it's also, sometimes it's discouraging maybe, because we, we, we're sitting here in a, you know, worshiping in a house, kind of rebelling against the organized church, and it often seems like that we're some, a bunch of weirdos and we're in the minority, and that is not true. Amen. There are multitudes of people who are who are leaving the institutional church and the organized church. Yeah. I'm not saying all of them are in a good place spiritually, or that they're all Christians that are doing it. But we are by no means in the in the minority. That's right. For for our views of what's going on in the church, and it doesn't make us. We sh we should be clear too as people. It doesn't make us happy to no. say what we say. I, I mean, Jer the prophets weren't happy mm -mm. to see right. Israel get judged and carried off by the Babylonians. This mm. didn't make Amos happy to say. It didn't make Jeremiah happy. And Jeremiah wrote a book called Lamentation. Yes, yeah. it doesn't well, make us happy. Mm. On the other hand, though, we are seeing God's word being fulfilled. That's it's right. Falling away. Jesus condemned the religious hypocrites of his day. This is a this is a recurrent theme throughout history, and we're seeing it. Amen. So it, it confirms the word of God. Doesn't make us happy, but it, it we can rejoice that God's word is being fulfilled. Amen. And we can all we should also understand that we are we are by no means some kind. It seems like we're a minority. But we're really not. There are a lot of people very dissatisfied with organized religion. That's the majority oh, yes. of people in our culture. Not all of them are in or not all of them are in the kingdom of God, but but this is the majority view. People are seeing this like they never have before. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's two oh uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, along the same lines Brother Jason was just commenting on in, in my own thinking. I know that there are people who view what we're doing as kind of a rebellious act, but I've never considered it rebellion no. because our allegiance is primarily to God, right. not to anything else. What we're doing is holding fast to what we know is true. Mm -hmm. And if it requires separation, then it requires separation. But rebellion, if we're going to if we're going to talk about rebellion, we have to talk about who it's against. And the organized church has been rebellious against her Lord. Yeah. And we refuse to to continue in their rebellion. Yeah, I didn't mean we we're being rebellious against her. No, I know you didn't. But a lot of people, you know, whenever you they say that, that, a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. They think of us as a, as yeah. a bunch of rebels. And, and that's not a correct view. When you think of falling away, now there's two there's two sides to the coin of falling away. Mm -hmm. One side is delusion. The other side is divine abandonment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. If you get up high enough, mm -hmm. God's pulled out. That's, right. That's why it fell down. Amen. Amen. You gotta get up high to see it. But that that's what happened. Because there's always been people trying to make encroachments to the church and they were they were protected, the faithful were protected against it. But see, when God withdraws, they're not. Just yeah. about whenever you think about these things, it is disheartening in, in one aspect. But whenever you think about the Lord's name and those that are jealous for his name, yes. then we can rejoice in the fact that he's separating himself from what is not like him. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what Amen. He's doing in this. He's showing that these people who were named after me. They're not like me. Yeah. And so he's separating himself so that his name will be pure. Amen. Yeah, amen. Yeah, you want to, there's ways you can master the art of doing this, but we must never leave any doubt that we are we are in fact attracted to and love those that love the Lord and love the truth. No matter who they are or where they are. Because sometimes it's just the fact that they have a certain name, that's not it. It's, it's their attitude toward the Lord that endears them to us. Amen. 
All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prophet Amos and for his faithfulness. We admire him for his spiritual stamina and fortitude in his unyielding spirit that he refused to keep quiet. We pray you would raise up men of that caliber in our generation that will speak forth the truth, and through them you will call the remnant out. In Jesus' name, amen.